Good morning everyone. Uh, today we are looking at the the message of the sanctuary and we are continuing with the series and today we are going to look at the the fifth furniture in the in this message and it is called the uh, altar of incense and as you can look as you can see from the screen uh, the on the uh, the box here this is this is the uh, the third <clears throat> this is uh, the third furniture in the holy place and uh, and so we well, let's see what we can learn from the altar of incense let's quickly go because I think today we may uh, if you hear any uh, any noise in the back in the background there is a dog outside um, so let's let, let's actually um, start. So first thing is what comes to mind about the altar of incense? Well, let's see what the Bible says that is uh, related to the incense. In the Book of Revelation, chapter five, verse eight, it says. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and the twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors or incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And in chapter 8 of Revelation, verse 1 to verse 4, it says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which, which, which stood before God, and to, them, and to them were given trumpet. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended before God ascended up before God out of the angel's hand and so the altar of incense or that Moses built on earth was a shadow of that which is in heaven and here we can see it clearly says that there was an altar right um, right here that he should offer it with the prayers of this of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne and of course the only altar before the throne is the altar of incense as you can see right here and so the incense represents the the prayers of the saints it represents prayer and so uh, in this life we need to pray in a sense and so we're gonna learn we're gonna get more to that but what kind of prayer should we pray and who should we pray to and those are the two main questions we're going to we are going to uh, to to look through in this uh, Bible study today let's do some more what is prayer Prayer is the life of the soul. Prayer is a necessity, for it is the life of the soul. Family prayer, public prayer have their place, but it is secret communion with God that sustains the soul of life. It's found in the book called Prayer, page 18. Christ is our only hope. Come to God in the name of Him who gave his life for the world rely upon the efficacy 
of his sacrifice. Show that his love, his joy is in your soul and that because of his, of this, your joy, your, your joy is full. Cease to talk unbelief and God is our strength. Pray much. Prayer is the life of the soul. The prayer of faith is the weapon by which we may successfully resist every assault of the enemy. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 88. And so, when you look at in the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, it talks about um, it talks about the blood, and it says that then God said not to eat blood because the blood is the life of the flesh. Well, in the spiritual sense, prayer is the life of the soul. If you want to live, you need to pray. When I say live, meaning live eternally, you will have to be praying because Satan is always doing his best to trip you. Now, the question is, did Jesus pray? Did Jesus pray? Well, Luke chapter 6, verse 10 through verse 12, and looking around and looking round about upon and looking round about upon them all, he said unto the men, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness, those are the Pharisees. They were filled with madness and communed one with one with another what they might do to do what they might to do what they might do to Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Matthew 14, verse 22, verse 23. And straightway Jesus con constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. And so, if Jesus, who never sinned, actually had to pray, then we should have any excuse not to pray. And that is a, a very, in, a very important for us uh, in these days. Now, I put this part right here um, because I think it's important, and we're gonna see why uh, why I, I mentioned that part. What is the symbol of the horn? Now, what meaning? What does the horn mean? And I'm not talking about the horn that is only found in this chapter or in this book, Daniel. But in the Bible, the, the term horn, what that term means. Now, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7 says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces, and stepped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. You see, I put the horns in capitalized. Ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another, another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the woods. And behold, this in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Then I would know the truth about the fourth beast, verse 19, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful whose teeth were of iron and his nail of brass, which devoured breaking pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake uh, great, very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellow, I beheld and the same horn made war with the with the saints and prevailed against them. Thus he said, 
The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it on, tread it down, and break it in pieces. And and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and it shall be diverse from the first, and it shall subdue three kings, and it shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the sins of the Most High, and thanks to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto him until the time and times and divided all the time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away the minion, in the little horn, to consume and to destroy it unto the end. Now, that was a mouthful of talk. So what does the what was what does the word horn mean? Well, um, if you look at in the Bible, the the term horn it means kingdoms. It means a power, right? It's a power that rise. And so, since it's a kingdom. It's also a nation, it's also uh, a power, then this is the idea we're going to see. Here is, the, here is the, the idea of it. We know, so question was, what does prayer have to do with the horn? Well, we know that in the altar, uh, in the altar of incense, there are horns, four horns on the corner. So first thing, we know that prayer is the life of the soul. We know that Jesus spent a lot of, Jesus spent a lot of time in prayer. We know that the horn typifies power, right? Because a kingdom is a power. We know that the blood is the life of the flesh. We know that the priest would put the blood on the horns of the altar of incense. And we know that the smoke of incense goes with the prayers. Now, here's the conclusion. Since we know what the word prayer means, meaning when you pray, that gives you power. Jesus prayed that gives him power over temptation. The horn in the, in the old days, when they took the blood and put on the horns, that was the symbol of power that the sinner would get to overcome temptation. And since blood is the life of the flesh, then Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ can give us that power with the prayer that we offer. And that is going to give us the power. The blood of Christ mingle with our prayer will give us the power to overcome sin to overcome temptation and that's why i read that part of the little horn not that it's connected with it but the word i was looking at the word horn and that word means power so christ's blood with our prayer mixed together gives us power to overcome sin now question is who should we pray to and this is this is going to be a very um interesting question because because it depends on it depends on your level of um, ability to pray if you are just learning to pray I wouldn't expect you to be uh, to pray the correct way way but if you've been praying for a long time you should know how to pray and who to pray to John chapter 14 verse 12 to verse 14 verily verily I say unto you this is Jesus speaking he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also also and greater works than these shall he do because i go unto my father and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name that i will do that the father may be glorified in the son if ye ask 
anything in my name. So what does that mean? Do we ask Jesus or do we ask the Father? So far we don't really know. Because Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name. So should we say, dear Jesus or the Father? And then we end in Jesus' name. Well, that text doesn't give us much clue. Let's go to a different text. John 15, verse, John 15 verses 15 to 17. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye ask, ye shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I commend you, that ye love one another. John 16 verse 22 through 24 and ye know that he, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I, I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Either though have ye asked nothing in my name, Ask and you shall receive that your joy will be full. And so, the idea is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is not for everyone. But if you are a, if you are a person that has been praying for a long time, you should know how to pray. That you pray to the Father. And not that I'm saying, if you don't pray to the Father, it's wrong. No, not at all. But uh, we should always be learning and get to do things better. And if Jesus says to pray to the Father and then and ask in His name, then we should we should think that this is the best way or the best approach of prayer is to go to the Father and then and then end in the name of Jesus Christ. So. Why pray? Why pray the Father in Jesus' name? Well, Jesus' name is the connecting link in prayer between humanity and God. In Christ, in Christ's name, our petitions are sent to the Father. He intercedes in our behalf, and the Father lays open all the treasures of His grace for our appropriation. For us to enjoy and impart to others. Ask in my name, Christ says. I do not say that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you. Make use of my name. This will give your prayers efficiency, and the Father will give you the riches of his grace. Wherefore, ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Christ is the connecting link between God and man. He has promised his personal intercession. He places the whole virtue of his righteousness on the side of the supplied. He pleads for men, and men in need of divine help pleads for himself in the presence of God, using the influence of the one who gave his life for the life of the world. As we acknowledge before God our appreciation of Christ's merits, fragrance is given to our intercessions. As we approach God through the virtue of the Redeemer's merits, Christ places us close by His side, encircling us with His human arm, while with His divine arm He grabs the throne of the infinite. He puts His merits as sweet incense in the censer in our hands in order to encourage our petitions. From the book of Prayer, chapter 217, entitled, Praying in the Name of Jesus. So, this is the idea, to pray in the name of Jesus. Go to the Father 
and same derivative name. Now there are exceptions, of course. Um, let's say you are in a danger, and you don't. You're not gonna go and say, um, "Father in heaven, please," and in Jesus' name. You can just say, "Lord Jesus, save me," like Peter. When Peter started to walk on the water, and he and he was afraid, the Bible said he turned because uh, he his heart felt uh, melt because he was afraid of the of the waves and the and the wind, and he started to sink. The only thing he said, "Lord, save me." And so there are cases where you are supposed to just say like a one word or one sentence, just to be uh, in the moment but in natural when you're praying you pray the father and you end in Jesus' name now another one for the next few days i worked early and late preparing for our people the instruction given me regarding the errors that were among in, in among that were coming in among us now this is something about praying as well and I'm gonna mention why I mentioned that right here. I would especially like to emphasize that the purpose of sharing names and organizations is not to tear down those within the church or to condemn people. That alone is the Lord's work. But there is there but there are people who are associating themselves with deadly errors, error that is infecting my child and yours, my family and yours, my neighbors and yours my church and yours. These individuals or in, in entities are publicly promoting the new spirituality. For that reason, it should be publicly denounced. It is not a denunciation of the individual themselves, but of the error they espouse. The Lord calls us to rebuke and exhort, but to do it in love, and this is our purpose. What does that mean is, what it means is that um, certain spiritual um, form people like to bring are from Satan. And so we have to be careful. We have to be careful of how and what we bring. And when somebody does something very, very bad, that is basically um, opposed to the Bible, then we need to bring it out. And we need to... Uh, make it public so people are aware that way they don't fall into that error as well and for instance this is what I'm talking about now watch this pastor um, who is teaching his church to pray directly to the Holy Spirit before I even I even say it, let's say this nobody knows what the Holy Spirit is or the work of the Holy Spirit Actually, we know that He is to to bring us unto all truth, but we don't know the nature of the Holy Spirit. So to pray to the Holy Spirit is flat out heresy from the Bible. Yes, it is God, but in in the Godhead, each entity in the Godhead has a role. God the Father is the Judge. Christ Jesus is our advocate or lawyer and the Holy Spirit is the one who actually takes our prayer to God and you can read Romans chapter 8 verse 26 where it says we do not know how to pray but the Holy Spirit uh, takes our prayer uh, to God in the sense and so the Holy Spirit's job is to take our prayer to God so we can't really pray to the Holy Spirit if He has to take our prayer. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit takes that prayer and brings it up before them, before the Father, through Jesus Christ. And so let's see what He is teaching His people in this case. Oh. Spirit came and brought power. If I could change one thing of the church today it would get us reconnected to the Holy Spirit and His power. When's the last time you prayed, Dear Jesus? Oh, probably today. When's the last time you said, Our Father? Eh, within a day. When's the last time you said, Dear Holy Spirit? 
I've got a prayer for you today. I know you're the one that's working on this earth right now. I know you're the one in control. I know you're the one bringing power, bringing knowledge, bringing wisdom, bringing comfort, bringing peace. I know you're the one that's right here, interactive with us right now. You are God, God the Spirit. I want to talk to you right now because there's something I need to have done right here in my, in my own life, in my own community. I, I need to partner with you on this. When's the last time you said, dear Holy Spirit, and said a prayer? If we could change one thing about the church today, I would get us reconnected with the Spirit and His power. I think it's unfortunate that the devil has used this tactic to try to downplay the Holy Spirit so much that there are actually people within our church today who are afraid of connecting the Holy Spirit with our church. They are fearful. No, They're fearful of terms like spiritual formation. And I, I don't have a problem with any term because I know God, God's not afraid of any term. God's not worried about any term. He can defend himself. When, when I need to form uh, my life into a, a stronger being, I need spiritual formation. I need, I need the spirit to truly form me into who he needs to be. When people are afraid of contemplative prayer, I tell them, hey, I always contemplate when I pray. I contemplate how great he is and how small I am. We need to, we need to forget all these terms and all these things. The tactics of the devil are in the church because he hates what we're doing. If we could change one thing about the church today is that would help us to connect with the Holy Spirit. Now, um, if you are listening, he mentioned two things. He mentioned something called spiritual formation and something called contemplative prayer. Now, let me show you what is wrong about that. First of all, it's either he is deceived or he is on purposely bringing an error into his church but let's see what is spiritual formation you see he said when i need to form my spirit into a better being that's a bunch of lies spiritual formation has nothing to becoming a better being here a movement that has provided a platform and a channel through which contemplative prayer is entering the church find spiritual formation being used and in nearly every case you will end you will find contemplative spirituality in fact contemplative spirituality is the heartbeat of the spiritual formation movement spiritual formation is an intentional christian practice much like the much like that of Eastern mysticism that has nothing to do with God, that's pagan, which claims as its goal the development of religious maturity that leads to Christian devoutness, which has its root in the ancient practices found in those of Catholic religious orders, ascetics, and others. Spirit formation is of Satan. Yeah, he makes it look nice, like when I need to form my, 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 myself into a better being. Oh, people are afraid of terms like contemplative prayer because I always contemplate how great and God is and how, how small I am. That has nothing to do with the term. Whatever he gave you on that video has nothing to do with what the term means. Spiritual formation doesn't mean you form yourself into a better being. Contemplative prayer has nothing to do with you contemplating, contemplating how God is great and how small you are. So let's see for let's see more than that. First of all, if you know who Ignatius Loyola is, he is the founder of the Jesuit, of it's called Society of Jesuits. And actually, here on the screen, you can see him holding uh, something in his hand while he is crushing a protestant head or under his foot and so let's see what the spirit formation actually is and let's see wh where it came from now um, this is from the book with controversy page 233 paragraph 3 throughout christendom Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. 
the first triumph of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned new forces hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the Order of Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience holy silence, they knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. The gospel of Christ had, ex at, had enabled its adherents to meet danger and endure suffering, undismayed by cold, hunger, toil, and poverty, to uphold the banner of truth in the face of, in face of the rack. To combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the, end, and the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prison and hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor, professing to have renounced the world, and bearing the sacred name of Jesus, who went about doing good. But under, the, on, but under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the, that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable but commendable when they served the interests of the Church, meaning the Catholic Church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters. They established colleges for the sons of princes and nobles and schools for the common people and the children of the Protestant parents were drawn into an observance of popish rites. All the outward pomp and display of the Romish worship was brought to bear to confuse the mind and dazzle and, captiv and captivate the imagination, and thus the liberty for which the fathers had toiled and bled for was betrayed by the sons. The, Jesu the Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe, and wherever they went, there followed a revival of popery. Good news and bad news. Mike Pence, guess what? He is a Jesuit. Mike, P Mike Pompeo, Jesuit. Pope Francis, Jesuit. Are they gaining ground? Yes. Now, let's talk about spiritual formation, which, is, which came from Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit movement. Let's see what it says right here. The spiritual, formation, the spiritual formation movement is spreading rapidly throughout the Christian community. The concept of being, actually you can find that in Amazing Discoveries. The concept of being formed spirituality is not wrong in itself, but many practices that accompany the movement miss the mark. Mystic rituals do not glorify the true God, but can instead lead us into dangerous spiritualism. So what is spiritual formation? Well, as Roger Oakland writes in his book, Faith Undone, the term spiritual formation suggests, suggests there are various ways and means to get closer to God and to emulate Him. Thus, the idea that if you do certain practice, you can be more like Jesus. That is spiritualism. That's a lie. That's an error. Why? Because there's only one way to get to God, to get closer to God, is by is through Jesus Christ only. 
getting close to God and become more like Him are wonderful. However, we must carefully choose the right means by which we seek a relationship with God. Oakland continues, Rather than having an indwelling of the person of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, spiritual form, rather than having an indwelling of the person of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, spiritual formation through spiritual disciplines supposedly transform the seeker by entering an altered real of consciousness. So it is fake. You do not get closer to God using spiritual formation. It is, it is a, uh, it is very fallacious, and is deceptive, and it's and it's from Satan. Let's see more. Lighthouse trail, amazing fact, amazing discovery still. Lighthouse trails called spiritual formation, a channel through which contemplative prayer is entering the church. Spiritual formation then can be seen as a way of seeking a relationship with God and a transformed inner self through the practice of, sp of spiritual and often mystical discipline. Unfortunately, many earnest Christians and Christian leaders are entering into spiritualistic lifestyle without even realizing it. Their desire to draw near to God is leading them to mystic and even occult rituals hidden among godly practices. This is the idea of spiritual formation. And of course he mentioned contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer is also called centering prayer. And think of it, centering prayer is about you. Centering prayer is about you, not God. It's you. Now, a centering prayer is an initial step of a contemplative prayer. Both of these are part of the tradition of Lectio Divina, a form of Christian meditation. In the centering prayer, the practice the practitioner focuses on a word, on a word, and repeats that word over and over for the duration of the exercise. So imagine this. You are saying one thing over and over and over and over and over for how many times? Who knows? It could be 10 minutes, it could be 12 minutes, it could be 15 minutes. That is not of God, that's of Satan. While centering prayer is done differently in the various groups that practice it, there are similarities. Centering prayer involves choosing a sacred word as the symbol of your intention to consent to God's presence and action within. Although this might sound like an innocent exercise, this type of prayer has no scriptural support whatsoever. In fact, it is just the opposite of how prayer is defined in the Bible. And actually, when you say something over and over and over and over, um, more than four and five times, your brain shuts down. How could that be of God? So the question is, did Jesus warn us about this type of prayer? Guess what the answer is? Oops. Guess what the answer is? Yes. Jesus talked about contemplative prayer. He talked about spiritual formation. He talked about centering prayer. Actually, he talked against them. Let's see what he says. Matthew chapter 6, from verse 6 to verse 8. Jesus said, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which is which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions. Wait a minute. Use not vain repetitions. That right here says what? The practitioner focuses on a word 
and repeats that word over and over and over for the duration of the exercise. This is called this is called vain repetition. And Jesus said, "Do not use vain repetition. Why? B because who uses the vain repetition? But when you pray, use not vain repetition." As the heathens do. Who are the heathens? Those are the devil worshippers. Come on, friend. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking, but not ye therefore like but not ye therefore like them unto them, like unto them. For you for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So what is contemplative prayer? What is centering prayer? It's a way to get us to Satan, not to God. And that pastor made it look nice, but it's deadly. And it will destroy your life. It will lead you far away from God. So do not practice contemplative prayer, no spiritual formation. No center in prayer, please don't do that. It's bad for you. Last slide. Last slide. Um, before we consider what some believe to be good things coming from Jesuits, right? Spiritual from spiritual instructors. Please consider the following history. Excuse me. Protestants and Seventh-day Adventist Bible scholars have long recognized, recognized the little horn power and beast power of Daniel 7, Daniel 8 in Revelation to the Roman Catholic Church and its satanically inspired opposition to Jesus, his faithful power follower, followers, and his word. This historical record of the Dark Ages are full of the stories of the of Catholic opposition to the Bible and Catholic efforts to destroy the scripture and to keep it from the common people. Ignatius Loyola began the Jesuit order for the clearly stated purpose of stopping and, uh, and undoing the Protestant Reformation which was simply a return to the teachings of scripture and a turning away from the spiritual traditions of the Catholic Church. In the Vatican today stands a marble statue of Ignatius Loyola honoring him for his leadership in destroying those choosing to follow scripture instead of Catholic tradition. The statue depicts Ignatius Loyola with one, one foot on the neck of a fallen Protestant, Protestant crushing out his life breath. Come now, let us reason together. Has the Jesuit order of the day suddenly had a conversion and is now seeking to spiritually strengthen their, their openly avowed enemies, the Seventh-day Adventists and other Protestants, the people of the book? This is not about the Catholic Church or people. It's about the system, the teachings. And so what they do is they, the, the papacy hates the Bible. Yeah, you, they may use it all the time to fake that they are actually following Christ, but they are not. Because if you study for yourself and you see what they are teaching you, you will see the contradiction. They do not want people to know the Bible. And that's why when you meet most Catholics, they do not know the Bible because they are not taught to study for themselves. Because if they were to study for themselves, they would leave the Catholic Church. And so this is this is the this is prayer. This is prayer. And so the question is, did Jesus warn us about those type of prayer? Yes. So Friend, this is the thing. I want people to know what's going on. And so, 
don't be fooled by people saying spiritual formation is to form you spiritually that is not true or to become better to become closer to god is not true contemplative prayer has nothing to do with god either neither does centering prayer so i hope today was uh, very helpful for everyone and today today is um june 13th 2020 and we are looking at the altar of incense which is the fifth furniture in the sanctuary message um we will see you again next sabbath june 20th and um, if i don't see you next sabbath or if i don't see you next sabbath at all i hope to see you again when jesus christ comes the second time until then uh, i hope we learn uh, how to pray let's do our best to learn to be to be to pray better and to pray the way that jesus christ um, taught us to pray and not fall into uh, mischief like other people do and so it was good to to share with you what i learned from this one until then bye for now